Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship by Venture for Canada. Venture for Canada is a national charity on a mission to foster the entrepreneurial skills and mindsets of young Canadians. Our vision is a Canada where young people can equitably realize their entrepreneurial potential to help build one of the most prosperous entrepreneurial ecosystems in the world. In this episode, we discuss building an innovative company in a traditional industry with Jeff Smith, chair of Ellis Dawn, which is one of Canada's largest construction companies with over $5 billion in annual revenue and 4,000 employees. Until recently, Jeff was CEO of Ellis Dawn for almost 25 years, leading the firm through transformational growth. Jeff has earned recognition as the recipient of the Ontario General Contractor Association Jock Tyndale Award for Integrity, EY's Canadian Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and the Donald P. Giffen Senior Construction Industry Achievement Award presented by the Toronto Construction Association. I've known Jeff for close to a decade, uh, and he has been a fantastic supporter of Venture for Canada and someone who I've gotten to know really well. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Thanks. Jeff and I have known each other for close to a decade, and we first uh, got to know each other when I cold emailed him in the first couple months of starting Venture for Canada. And over the last uh, 10 years, uh, I have had many different interactions uh, with uh, with Jeff, and we've developed um, a great friendship. And I think that Jeff could speak on tons of different topics, but one thing that he is particularly well-suited to speak about is building an innovative company in a traditional industry. And this is because Jeff, uh, over the last uh, three decades, has transformed Alliston from a traditional uh, general contracting company to uh, a diversified uh, construction giant uh, in the Canadian uh, space that does many different things, including um, develop uh, software. Uh, So, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Nice to be here, Scott. Nice to know you over the past 10 years. We've had a lot of fun together. Agreed. So, to kind of get things kicked off, Jeff, can you give a little bit of context of what was Elliston like as a company when you first took over as CEO in the mid-1990s? Well, I guess uh, I took over in late in November, late 1996. And uh, the, the good news is that the company had like a 45 year history of building great buildings. We built the Rogers Center, all sorts of things. And we had a core at the company of terrific builders, people who really knew how to get things done as good as anybody in the industry. The bad news was that the company was in terrible shape financially and the company had not adjusted from the old school world that my dad had grown up in, which was tougher, low price gets the job. You know, you're tough on the subs, you're tough on your clients. Uh, We made a couple of bad investments. And so A, we were running out of money, but B, we we just, the clients didn't like us much and none of the subcontractors that we needed to do the work like liked us very much. So we were really in deep trouble and probably about six months away from, you know, some sort of, from closing the doors or some sort of collapse. So it was it was good in one sense, but it was really terrible in another sense. That's the situation in late 1996. What were the early days of the company like? Like uh, you, your father founded uh, Elliston. Uh, what was the company's journey from the kind of early days of being uh, founded to, to that kind of like mid 1990s uh, point? Well, my dad, you're talking about when my dad started the company? He started it from nothing. My dad was a depression era kid, had had no money. His father died when he was young. One of these typical entrepreneurial stories. The first uh, contract was an addition on a house in London, Ontario. He was 27, 28 years old when he started. And he just worked really, really hard and 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 kept driving and driving and driving. And you know, by late 1996, we were a billion dollar company, which was which was something very impressive uh, with a great with a great track record. And he, he just kept plowing away, expanded to the West, expanded to the Maritimes, uh, expanded for a little while to Saudi Arabia, but then closed that down. Uh, so just working away as a general contractor where you bid on a job and if you're low, you get the, you get the job. And if you're not low, you don't get it. So very hard driving, uh, really a, a tough, a tough operation, I would describe it, but, but, but a solid track record of great building uh, accomplishments. 
I can imagine it would be complicated uh, working with your father, particularly in, in the context of what you mentioned of there being challenges that you and him not necessarily seeing kind of eye to eye. How did you navigate that uh, kind of business tension within the context of also being like family members of being father and, and son? I would say, Scott, that both of us navigated it very poorly. I would say he did and I did as well. You know, by the late, by the mid 1990s, he's in, he's now in his early 70s. He wouldn't let go. He wanted to stay in control. Uh, he was a tough guy, fired most of the come and stay for a while and then he'd fire them and then he'd bring in new people. Um, so, so he, it was still his company, his name on the door. Whereas I was president for a while before I became CEO and, and we just fought bitterly and I was too aggressive and trying to take over and trying to show him that I could run the show. So we were like two strong personalities colliding, fighting all the time through the nineties, which was a very tough time in the industry to the point where just when I turned 40 in 1995, I quit. I quit and left the company. And uh, and then came back in a year later when the company had deteriorated further and my dad really wanted out. He tried to sell the company. In the meantime, that had just fallen through. Actually, a family friend mediated my return to the company. And I said, well, I'll come back. No disrespect to Don, but only if he retires. So he agreed to retire. Uh, I came, I walked in the door and and he walked out of his own company and left. And uh, I just started from, I just started from there. And as I described it, it was a pretty tough situation. We just started working away. So kind of going back to that 1996 uh, point of you becoming a CEO and kind of taking over, uh, this is a somewhat broad uh, question, but can you describe in us the at a high level the journey of taking Ellis Don from uh, a more traditional uh, construction company in the mid 1990s that was struggling to make uh, payroll to uh, a company today that is much more modern, much much larger than it was in the mid 90s, uh, more profitable. Uh, so in essence, like what what were some of the things that you did to overcome these challenges uh, and build Ellis Don into the company that it is today? Okay, so this is going to be very high level. So we did two or three things in order. Remember, you're talking about a 20, 25 year journey. The first thing we had to do in the 90s was to get confidence and affection. I use that word uh, uh, on purpose of our clients because because they didn't like us and they didn't trust us. So the first thing we had to do was reestablish that trust. We did that by opening our books on every project to every client. I said, I'll show you every number, even if it's lump sum, it's your money. Uh, I'll work with you. I'll do I, for two years. I did nothing but go around to clients and 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 beg them to trust me. And it took a long time, and, and it it took much longer than I thought. I thought I could do it in six months. It took two or three. It took two or three years. So rebuilding, uh, starting to rebuild a level of trust with our clients was the very first thing. Starting to rebuild a level of morale with our employees was another thing. When I was gone from the company, my dad had been bad mouthing me, blaming the problems of the company on me. To some extent that was accurate, but to some extent it wasn't. Uh, so then I came back and I go, well, who's this guy? He's back, we thought he was gone. And you know, our lenders and our surety companies, we just had to reestablish confidence with all of them. And I had to convince these people at Elliston to stay and to give me a chance. So that took the first three or four years, just that. And you know we had to pick up work in the meantime, obviously, uh, which, which we did. And then we had to look at it and say, okay, but really the industry is completely changing now. It's no longer lump sum. It's all about a service industry. It's all about uh, you know making your clients happy as opposed to just giving them the low price. So then the next thing we had to do was instill in a tough construction company a service mentality just like any service operator. You know, I used to tell our people, we're not builders, we're service providers. The, the subcontractors are the builders. We've got we've to we've change our way of thinking. And that took a, a long time. Some people left the company. So changing the whole way of thinking inside the, the company was, was the next big thing. And then the third thing was saying, okay, now the industry is, is changing. The, the whole model of the industry, forget Ellis Don for a minute, uh, over the past, you know, I don't know, five decades is changing. Uh, it doesn't work. 
you can't have a situation where the construction industry is made up of clients who who uh, are unhappy that the buildings aren't being done on time and the architects are blaming the contractors and the contractors are blaming the architects and everybody's blaming it. every it's a big blame game so we started it's, i'm trying to simplify a very complicated situation we started saying at Elliston, we'll take more responsibility. So we'll take responsibility for design. We'll actually take responsibility for the way the, the the way the buildings operate when they're done. We won't we won't blame anybody else. We could see back then in the late '90s, the early 2000s, that digital was coming and was going to take over. That was going to drive everything together. And then the other thing that happened was. The method of procurement changed to, you know, these public-private partnerships where one party had to be responsible for everything. Our competitors went out and found partners, uh, you know, hospital operators, hospital financiers. We said, no, we're going to take responsibility for the operations over 30 years, which no contractor had ever done before. We're going we're gonna to get in the middle of financing these big projects. We went out and built those relationships. None of that had ever been done before. So we went from a model of just being a builder, which most of our competitors were, over the course of about 10 years from, you know, the early 2000s to say 2015, to being a builder who could provide the financing, who could provide the design, who could uh, uh, provide the operations of the building. Uh, and it, that just changed everything for us. It took, it took a long time for our clients and the governments to understand that we would that we were now a whole different kind of company. But but that changed the model, and we think we've changed the model in the construction industry. We certainly changed it for Ellis Dawn, became much more than we ever were. And then finally, and this is the last step, and frankly, we're still in the middle of this step, how do you turn Ellis Dawn into a digital company? Because, and into a software company. Because the same software that designs the building is going to be the software and is now the building, the software that builds the building is now the software that operates the building after it's built. If you don't control that software, you don't control your destiny. So uh, that's a, that's the 20, 25 year journey in 20 or 25 sentences. I hope I haven't gone on too long, uh, step by step. Uh, but we've now got you know these 24 different uh, profit centers uh, but but if a client comes to us, we can say what do you, whatever you want, we can provide it for you. You know, we can we can develop software. We got two hundred software people in our in our uh, in our IT department. We can operate your building. We can we can do whatever you want, and we'll and we'll take responsibility for the whole thing from we call it cradle to grave from the beginning to the end. That's the journey. You did a great job summarizing uh, close to three decades uh, in a couple of, uh, of minutes. And one thing that I wanted to zoom in, uh, in about is that experience in the early 90s of you taking over as CEO and in essence entering into a, a situation that it sounds like there was like a very low trust situation, that there were a lot of people who like your dad had worked with for like probably decades who populated kind of like the leadership um, of, uh, of the company. The company was about to like run out of money. Uh, how did you come in at, uh, in, in coming in as CEO? How did you foster trust uh, and build a, a kind of culture of trust amongst uh, your colleagues over time? So it's just a terrific story, maybe one of the most important ones that I've learned over over my whole career, and uh, that comes out of out of your question. And that is, when I first got back, I just went and said, uh, you know, please let's just 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 give me a shot here. I went to the key employees, I went to all of them individually and basically said, give me a shot. And then for two years, while we were going through the financial crisis of rebuilding the balance sheet through the crisis of trying to get work and rebuild uh, trust with our clients, et cetera, everybody just had their head down and I've, like, and everybody worked. And it wasn't, I used, I used to joke that when you come back from lunch and your desk is on fire, it's not hard to set priorities, right? We all just worked. And then after two, it wasn't for about two years, I started to think, so now let's say it's late 1998, 1999, that I had a chance to reflect and say, well, why didn't these people leave? Like, why did the corp, with, if, if we'd have lost the 10 top people, the company was finished, like done. Why didn't they leave? Our, our competitors were trying to hire them away. The company was in really in shambles. My father and I had been fighting, so it's not like they were inspired by the leadership. 
So I couldn't figure out why they stayed. I went and asked them. And two or three people said, you know, blah, blah, blah. They gave me the usual answer. One guy, a guy named Rick Magicomo, said, well, if you want to know, I'll tell you. And I said, well, clearly I want to know. He said, well, we all talked about it. We got together as a group. And we decided we liked working together. And if we all split up, we wouldn't get to work together. And we thought we could save the company. And so uh, we decided to do that. And I started to laugh at, not at him, but with him and say, well, gee, you could have told me, right? And it wasn't that I wasn't working hard, but they didn't need me to tell them what to do. They didn't need me to, to uh, motivate them. They're already motivated. And they had, they had enough self-confidence that they knew they could do it, and they decided they wanted to do it. It, it made, made a huge impact on my what I'll call my leadership philosophy, because now we hire people. We don't hire people and tell them what to do. We don't hire people and try and motivate them. We, we hire terrific people and say, go do it, right? These people, these people save the company without even asking my permission. And it's not like I wasn't working. It's not like I didn't earn their respect. I like to think that I did. But that wasn't it. The point was they respected each other and they respected themselves. So they went. So now Elliston is this place where we give one of our key values is freedom and trust. We trust you to do your job. We set you free to do your job. So go do your job. And, and uh, you know, you got to do your job, clearly. But, but we're not going to set all these policies and rules and rules and operation books and all that crap. We just try and hire great people and set them free. And then when they have ideas about how to build the company, they bring them forward and we go, that's a great idea. How did you get 24 profit centers? We got 24 profit centers because people came forward and said, I've got this idea, let's do this. And a lot of them you don't do, of course, but every now and again, somebody comes in and you go, well, that's a terrific idea, well, let's do that. So you do that. And that, that's that's frankly how we did it. We just we just didn't worry so much about everything. We didn't worry so much about a strategy. We didn't worry so much about uh, you know about the traditional thinking. We just said let's let's get some some great people and see where they take us. And that's what we did. And that all came out of that conversation with Rick Magicomo when he, when he told me why they stayed. All of it. Two different takeaways from what you said. The first is the line that things move at the speed of trust and that if there's that high level of trust, like you can do amazing things, uh, particularly if you're a leader and you're trusting your uh, different um, uh, direct uh, reports. Um, and the second thing is the importance of emergent strategy. And just like to your point, I think a lot of big or, or more bureaucratic organizations can just create these really big long-term plans and say, this is, this is our five-year plan, 10-year plan. And to your point, it sounds like what you folks at Ellis Dawn did were you were very emergent. You brought in good people. You took a uh, look at your external environment, and then you went and tested a bunch of different ideas, and you doubled down on the ones that worked. So two things. That, that's exactly right. The level of trust has to go right down, not just to your senior people, not just those 10 people I mentioned, not just to the, you know, as the company grows, not to the 50 managers across the company. It has to go right down to the project manager, the superintendent. They have to give it to the field engineers. Uh, they have to give it. So one of the great things I saw when it was a magazine article about us is like, I don't know, 20 years ago now. And one of the superintendents said, uh, what I like about Ellis Don is, is the other people here, uh, they don't stab me in the back to have my back. And if you can get a company where everybody, A, feels free because they know they've got the trust to do the work in their own way, you know, within rules, we all have to have the same values and you have to be good at your job. But that, but that if things go wrong, you're not going to get knifed. It just makes, uh, makes a huge difference. So that's the first point. The second point around strategy, it's not like we don't have a strategy. We give a lot of thought to where the industry is going and what we need to do. However, you're right. I don't believe in 50 year plans. Some of my, CEO friends have 50 year plans or 15 year plans. We have a strategy that kind of covers the waterfront. Uh, and then whatever happens, we like to be ready for it. And we also say we're entrepreneurial. So even if something comes up, I can give you an example if you want, that's not in the strategy. Well, we'll just pivot and go do it. We call it fast, fluid, and flexible. 
So our strategy is very, our values are rock solid. They don't change. But our strategy, yeah, we'll change it tomorrow if the world changes as it as it does. What? So, so let me give you let me give you one quick example. When COVID hit, we lost no everybody stopped building office towers. Nobody's built an office tower since COVID. Big part of our work. Nobody built retail anymore. You know, big part of our work. So now what do we do? Well, what they were still building was mixed-use residential. Within about a year, we became one of, in the Toronto market anyway, one of the market's biggest builders of mixed-use residential, right? These big condo towers that you see go up. If you go back through all the strategic updates, I, I don't call them plans, I call them updates, that I gave, that I gave to the board, I, used, I joked with them about this. You never saw the, world, the word mixed-use residential in my strategic plans once, not once. It wasn't a market that I thought we should be in. But then when the other markets disappeared, hell, we went there in a heartbeat. And, we, and without it, we'd have been in real trouble through the, through the two or three COVID years. So that's an example of how you change your strategy in a minute. Yeah, being super responsive to the external environment and, and how things like the pandemic can, can cause lot, like long-term changes. To your point, like commercial real estate is probably forever uh, changed, uh, or at least in the, ne the next uh, kind of uh, decade. One thing I'd love to zoom in on a little bit as well from that kind of early 90 or the mid 90s experience where you became a CEO is the cash flow challenges. And you mentioned that the organization had like six months of cash in the bank that you were afraid or even less, uh, you were afraid uh, that the company wasn't going to be able to meet uh, payroll. How, like to kind of go into the weeds a little bit, Jeff, um, how did you... Uh, lead Ellis on to improve the cash flow uh, situation. Well, it's a very, it's a very tough question because it's a very, very good question, of course, because you can't let people know. I'm going to speak very candidly here. You can't let the the industry know. You can't let your employees know that you're on the brink with respect to cash flow, which we were for the period of about. It actually got worse after I got there because we had these bad jobs we had to finish. So from about six months after I got there for about another 12 months in the late 90s, we were going week to week. And uh, there's only three of us in the company knew. Me, the CFO, and the, and the number two finance guy. And, um, you know, we had to sometimes, um, I don't want to say we didn't tell the truth, but we didn't tell the whole truth. Uh, we certainly didn't let the people know. Our banker knew it, so the banker had to trust us, uh, which he did. Fortunately, he was a good guy. If he was a tougher guy, we never would have made it. Uh, and uh, and so you you can't not pay your subcontractors uh, because they'll just stop working. So it's not like you can, at the end of the week, say, well, who do we pay and who do we not pay, even though we did some of that. So it was a very careful dance for about six months um, or 12 months. It scared the hell out of me. And then, but we were picking up some good work in the meantime. We picked up two really great projects. We got ahead of the projects on cash flow, meaning we billed the owner more than we were spending. And uh, one day our CFO came in and he said, that I've done the cash flow projections. And if we can last another three months, then we're going to be fine. And I said, well, we've lasted nine months. We can last another three. I'll kill people to last if we have to last another three. And so, but was it terrifying during those nine months? Six, nine, twelve, I gotta say nine to twelve months. It was terrifying. Is there a silver bullet to how you manage your way through a cash flow? There is not. Every situation is different. You just have to work through it. Uh, that's all I can say. We came very close to not making it. And everybody would have said we're a bunch of failures. We did make it. So now everybody says we're, oh, look at that success. I can't tell you how close we were to not making it. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes in the mid 90s of you're taking over this business that there's also a lot of family like legacy and and I imagine to some degree emotion kind of tied into it. Uh, you're facing this uh, these immense kind of cash flow challenges. You would also, I believe, all had like, three young kids um, at the time in terms of like your like family uh, yeah. and just the immense kind of pressure that, uh, and you, you were also relatively early in your career. You would have been in your like early 
uh, 40s. So this is a little bit more of like a psychological kind of question. But like, just kind of putting myself in your shoes, I, I, I would be just feeling super overwhelmed and the degree of like stress and pressure and the amount of uh, responsibility. How did you on a personal level, Jeff, navigate through that like intensely stressful period of time? Well, so I should say, first of all, I'm no hero. If I'd have known uh, how much trouble the company was in when I decided to come back, I probably wouldn't have come back. Uh, so it was only when I got there and I was in about six or seven or eight months and kept getting worse and worse. And with these projects in the States kept bleeding us for cash and people suing us and I'm going, oh my God. So first of all, it's not like I, I walked in knowing and then like some guys, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna slay this dragon. I didn't know the dragon was there. And then I get in there and there's this horrible dragon. Uh, and you, what do you do? You, you, you're there <laughs> and you got kids at home and you've got, uh, and I was flying and not home all the time. And I talk, I joke about it with my kids now. My one that my kids used to, in the backyard, a plane would go over and they'd wave at the plane and say, hi, dad. Uh, so I, I wasn't, I, I like to think I'm a pretty good father, but during those years, I was probably not that good a father, not that good a husband. Um, and, um, but I, I don't know what else to say, except I didn't have it. You don't have a choice. You're not going to walk away. The other thing is you can see progress being made slowly. So you go, okay, well, I'm going to get there. After a while, you could say, okay, we are going to get there. We're not going to fail. And, um, and, and that's, and, and that's, that was my wife happy with me a lot of the time. No, uh, I get along very well with my kids and always have, but I wasn't there a lot. And uh, that's the way it is. And and like I said, we we did have good people, and the and the the more that people could see progress making, the better my relationships grew with those people. And uh, I I gave them all sorts of authority to run the company. I'm not a builder. That's how we got through it. We just got through it. So to the point of values, and you talked earlier about trust and and that sense of like giving people authority, devolving responsibility. What do you think are some of, or what are some of the other like principal kind of like values of Alistair as a company? So we've got, we've got five of them. I'll give you, I don't know if I'll go through all five, but the first one is we pound on his trust. And what that means, people think, well, that's establishing trust with our clients. It's actually, well, that's key. It's not what we, uh, it's not what it means. It means we trust the employees, right? So that, we just say, and we've talked about it already, so I won't go on about that, but I can't tell you how important that is because then employees go, okay, well, I can go off and do a great job here because I'm trusted. Huge. And, and they can, and they know whether they're trusted or not. You can't fake it, right? So you have to talk to them all the time. The second one, we just, there's no fancy word for it. We, we call it complete openness. We give our employees all the financial statements. We give our employees we give our, as I told, said, we give our clients all their numbers. We give our employees the business plans, which say, did we hit our numbers that we said we we're going to hit last year? Like if the employees know, forget whether the shareholders maybe come to that, but if they know everything that's going on in the company, be open with them and the clients know you're being completely open with them, that obviously builds trust. It's huge. I keep saying to the employees, our, our team, I should say, all, just lay down your cards. Just stop holding your cards so close to your chest. Lay them down, and you're and everybody, everybody will trust you. So, so that complete and that openness is so difficult you can't imagine because of, because if I have if I have my hands on this information and I don't give it to you, I have power over you. As soon as I lay my hands down, whether you're a client or another employee, I've given away my power to you. I can't tell you how tough that is. And the other one is. We just talk about having an entrepreneurial philosophy uh, all the time. So if you have an idea, bring it forward. If you've got an idea for a new business or a new way to do things, uh, bring it forward. And maybe we'll put you in charge of it. We've done that. People come forward with an idea. We say, good, congratulations. You're now running your new profit center at Elliston. Was your idea? Go run with it. Uh, and sometimes they make it and sometimes they, they don't. Uh, those are the three uh, that 
that that are really uh, key to just getting a culture going that changes the company, sets the company on a path for growth. But what it really does is when we're recruiting people, because now it's a war for talent out there, I don't need to tell you, you can say, come and work for us. This is a place where you're listened to, where you get all the information, where we trust you, where you get to build your own career, and you can attract great people that way. So it's a recruiting machine as much as anything, those values. I'll stop there. So to the point of uh, fostering an entrepreneurial culture within a company, one of the things that I've observed over the years in uh, talking with a lot of entrepreneurs who have built and scaled companies is in the earlier days, a company has this really entrepreneurial culture. Uh, People are much more willing to take risks. But as a company becomes more developed, uh, more profitable, uh, inertia can kind of set in. Bureaucracy uh, sets in, like um, uh, an emphasis on systems. So how do you foster an entrepreneurial, innovative culture within Elliston in the context of you being now like a $5 billion plus company that employs like thousands of, of people across Canada and the world? So it's a really good question. And it's, it's really tough because as the company grows and as it spreads, especially construction companies where where even if you're just in Toronto, all your projects are spread all over, right? So so how do how do you get how do you get the word out there? Uh, and and the answer is you, you just keep talking to people first of all. So so I I would meet every quarter I would meet with every new employee as a group, not one by one. And we would talk about the values and we talk about anti-bureaucracy. And we would talk exactly about that, how companies grow and bureaucracy sets in and how we're gonna, how we're gonna fight that and how we need the new employees to help us fight it. Bureaucracy, I've learned to, to a very large degree does not grow from the top as companies, as companies grow. Bureaucracy sets in from the middle. People make mistakes and middle managers say, they're, they're doing their best for the company. They're saying, we can't make that mistake, so let's have a policy that prohibits that mistake from happening again. And before you know it, you've got a company full of policies rather than a company full of great people with the freedom to do their job. And what you have to say is not what policy do we need when the mistake made that cost us a lot of money, but what did we learn? Okay, let's make sure everybody learned from that mistake. Okay, now go out and we'll be free again. But But it's really difficult because because as the company grows, the number of policies does grow. It just has to. And there's this constant tension between, between structure, which is what the bureaucrats call it, and entrepreneurialism on the other side, which some people call chaos, right? So you're always trying to find the, the right balance between the two. And of course, you never do. So you just keep fighting and fighting. And, you, and I always had to drill it into the senior managers. And and then I had to drill it into the uh, in into the middle managers, and uh, it, you just it's a fight that never stops. And you have to say who, you know. I, I get them. We we grew to our, where our employment letters we'd hire we'd hire you, Scott, and you get a three page employment letter. Well, who the hell needs a three page employment letter? Even the Bank of Nova Scotia does it in one page. And all of a sudden, I found out that we're doing this. We had all these policies around hiring people that grew up out of nowhere. And all of a sudden it would take us three weeks to hire somebody and our competitors were hiring people in three days. You go throw that, throw that bureaucracy. I don't know how that happened. It's like mushrooms, they popped up overnight. Go get rid of all that policy and just hire some. And so it, you just have to keep fighting it. And, it, and, it, and, it, and the bureaucracy grows anyway. And you, you have to have these huge fights. No, we don't need that policy. Yeah, we do. No, we don't, get rid of it. Anyway, it's really difficult. That's all I can say. But as long as the as long as the leadership is consistent, and I don't just mean the CEO, but but you know those that say the ten or twenty, say the twenty four profit center leaders. As long as they get it, then you then you can fight it. If they don't get it, you're screwed. In the context of Elliston having twenty four different uh, kind of profit centers across the the organization and being a quite diversified uh, company. One thing I sometimes reflect on of CEOs of big companies is that is how they 
address uh, issues in specific business units. So I'm sure probably over the years you've had, let's say there's one of these, uh, there's one of these 24 uh, profit centers where uh, it's it's bleeding money to the company, right? It's 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 something that's going really downhill. There's there's a lot of issues in this specific isolated aspect of your overall kind of like operations. Um, how do you as a CEO go in and and kind of uh, figure out like what is the root cause of actually that's causing like the the business unit to to fail? And then relatedly, how do you what what are some of the steps that you've taken in the past to then fix the situation? To in essence do like a turnaround of that business unit within the org. Well, so it's it's a great question. The answer is because it obviously happened a lot, uh, way more way more than I want to admit. And what you do is you call all the resources in. So you've got a private center, let's call it an, a, a construction operation in, I don't know, we're just going to pick Calgary because it's never happened in Calgary. So I'll pick Calgary. Um, and it's going sideways and it's just not performing and the numbers keep getting worse and they keep promising to make them better and they never get better, they make them worse. What you do is you bring all your resources to bear on it. So there's a lot of great people in this company, uh, some of them at the top level. You know, obviously we got senior operations people. You you take people from Toronto and ship them to Calgary. Say, because I'm not a builder. I never pretended to be a builder, but there's a lot of great builders, as I said earlier. So the first is you bring all your resources to bear to A, try and stop the bleeding, and B, try and figure out what's gone wrong here and how do we fix it. So a couple of things might have gone wrong. One is, frankly, you you might have a leader that's failing. Uh, in which case, in the end, you have to, you can't wait too long, you have to replace that leader. Secondly, so let's forget Calgary for a minute and go a bit more broadly, because some of the prop centers are new. Uh, it, it just might, sometimes it's something that's unfixable. You thought you could get into this business, you thought this would work. Newfoundland, for example, we went into Newfoundland. And after three years in Newfoundland, I'm doing nothing but losing money. We just realized we weren't from Newfoundland. Uh, we didn't have any relationships there. The subs didn't want us there. The other generals didn't want us there. The clients didn't really want us there. It didn't matter who we sent to Newfoundland. It didn't even matter if we hired a Newfoundlander, which we did. It just wasn't going to work, or at least it was it was causing us way more money than it was worth. So we shut it down. So sometimes it's not the leader's fault. It's sometimes it's the initial premise was wrong. And sometimes you just your process is like you got to go in and figure out, and then A, can I fix it? either by changing the people or changing how we're doing it, the, or B, should have, should we have been there in the first place? And then you, you solve it that way. And we've had all of those. To the point about people challenges or, or challenges with just like a low performing leader, one thing that's come up in some other interviews, and I've had some personal experience with as well, is that as an organization grows, uh, bad leaders can kind of uh, hide themselves within the organization. That... Uh, th there can be, uh, you know, some people are very good at managing up or, or presenting an image that, that things are good when in reality there are uh, more uh, challenges. And to your point, there's a benefit of if somebody is not a good fit of how to exit them as quick uh, as, as possible. So as you've scaled Elliston, uh over the years, how have you uh, can build systems or approaches that have ensured that like ineffective leaders who aren't a good values fit for the organization um, uh, don't have the opportunity to just kind of like hide out uh, and, and continue to potentially cause damage. So one of the values that I didn't mention is what we call uh, mutual accountability. I used to call it up and down accountability. So if you have complete openness, like at our, we have twice a year, we have meetings with every Salvian employee in an area, and we put all the numbers up on the screen, all of them. So if you're a superintendent and your job is losing money, if you're an area manager and you said, like the Toronto area manager has to get up in front of everybody in Toronto and say, well, here's these are my numbers. Here's what I said I was going to do for you all, and here's what we're doing. Like the numbers are the, the numbers. And then, of course, we do client satisfaction surveys, et cetera. But then we do... Twice a year, those 24 profit center managers, twice a year have to come in and get up in front of the other 24, plus the other people like the CFO and 
you know, all of those people. So there'd be 50 people in a room and you have to get up and say, here I am, let's go to Calgary again. Because, And say, this is what I said I was going to do. And this is what I did. I said I was going to make like $5 million this year. And I lost three. Well, you can't hide. You either lost three or you didn't lose three. Well, you can get away with that once. But the second or third time, there's no hiding. You can manage up all you want. I can like that person all I want. Oh, I love Fred. Fred's such a great guy. Fred buys my wife flowers and said, and he tells me what a great CEO I am. I really love Fred. Yeah, but the numbers suck, Jeff. Like, and so I'll just tell you this one quick story. This is great around openness. I had an employee get up. This is back in the early 2000s. And he was from Calgary. He said, Jeff, I'm a shareholder in this company, and I want to know why we're not shutting down the U.S. operation. It's never made money. Making money now. I don't see a plan to make money. Why are we there? He's asking me this in front of basically everybody, right? So I gave him an answer. I said, well, remember, it takes time, and you got to build relationships, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I said, uh, Craig was his name. I said, Craig, we had trouble getting going in Calgary where you are. And we finally built it up and now look what's going. It just takes patience. And he said to me, yeah, I'm not buying this. This is a project manager reaching up three or four, three levels, say, to tell the CEO he's not buying it. The CEO, what the CFO, CEO is telling him is bullshit. And two years later, we shut down the U.S. operation. So even the CEO doesn't get to hide. I was emotionally connected to the yeah. my to my U.S. operation called bullshit. Everybody could see it. I could see it. In the end, we shut it down. That's how you do it. Fascinating. And I agree. It's, it, it can exist that the uh, cognitive biases can impact everyone in the organization, including uh, the CEO. One uh, topic I'd love to close on uh, is uh, the topic of employee ownership, because I think it's something that's a very innovative uh, thing that you folks have done uh, at uh, Elliston. Um, why did you make the decision to transfer from family ownership to uh, to employee ownership kind of gradually over time? Well, because I'm not a believer in, in family ownership in the construction industry. You know, we nearly went broke when my dad and I were trying to do it. So we didn't really make the first transition. or We, we barely, barely, barely made it. Uh, and I think if you're going to attract the very best people in the industry, you got to be able to say that whoever is the best at this company gets to be the next CEO. And as soon as you go away from meritocracy to family, I think something big is compromised. A lot of people do it, good for them, but not for us. Plus, I fought with my dad and lost my relationship with my dad. I didn't want to fight with my kids and lose my relationship with my kids. Like it was very important to me. I was I was scarred by that. I'm talking very candidly now. Uh, so so first of all, let the employees let the employees lead the company. Family ownership means family leadership. It just it just does. Secondly, construction is interesting because we don't need a lot of construction finances itself. So I don't need to go out to the public markets for financing if the company is well run. I don't need to go out to private equity uh, if the company is well run because of the company finances itself. Therefore, I have the opportunity to make the employees a really good deal basically to loan them the money from the company so that they can buy the family out over time. The family does very well, thank you. My siblings and my nieces and nephews and me, my kids will do, you know, we'll, we did well out of this. So we've been treated fairly. The employees not only get to run the company, we have an outside board that gets more complicated, but then they get the benefits. If they're the ones making all the money, why shouldn't they get that money that they're earning? Why should some private equity person get it? Why should some third generation family member get, get it? It doesn't make any sense to me. Give it to the people that make it. And then when they leave, make them sell their shares to the next people and let them, the money they make, they get to keep. Well, it's perfect. Now, every industry can't do it, but we can do it. Our big competitor, PCL, is employee owned, right? It, and it just works so well because now you've got employees who care about the company because they own it. And so they'll stand up and say to the CEO, why are you doing this stupid thing? I'm a shareholder. I'd, I've had shareholders come up to me and say, you need a holiday. I don't think you're performing at your 
at your best, uh, at your top, you seem to me to be stressed out. Go take a holiday. I'm a shareholder. I'm not telling you because I care about you. I'm telling you because I'm a shareholder. You're not, you're not on your game, dude. So when you get employee shareholders that act like owners because they are owners, changes everything. But I have to say, the key was that we could do it because the construction finances itself. So the opportunity was there to do it. And some companies just don't have that. They need external capital to finance their growth. We have the luxury in this business of not needing it. Yeah. I think it's brilliant what you've done on, on two levels. I think one is that it sets the company up for really being a company that can be thriving like 60 years from now. I think when you're employee uh, owned, it's a lot more resilient because uh, to your point, lots of family businesses can have a lot of drama. And I think that a, it sounds like uh, an employee owned structure is a lot more resilient for the long haul of how you build a, a long term you know, Canadian success story. That is maybe around in the 22nd century. Uh, and the second is that, to your point, it's just also ethical, right? It, it is, uh, uh, and it, it is, I think it's quite, uh, in many sectors of the Canadian economy, it's very rare for there to be employee ownership. There's an increasing, uh, I would say, a lot more conversations around the benefits of uh, employee ownership. And I think that what you've done is specifically in the context of such a large company is, is a great role model for a lot of other uh, entrepreneurs uh, to consider. The last thing I'll say is really important if anybody's listening and wondering whether to do it uh, is that we have an independent board and we have a, a way to appoint the board, which is too boring to go into here. But it's really important to mention, I think, because the new CEO, me, when I was CEO, I didn't need to worry about what the shareholders thought of me, my brothers and sisters, for example, or the other employees. The new CEO, Kieran Ha, like he's got to listen to his employees because otherwise he'll alienate them. But he doesn't answer to them. He answers to a board, an independent board. And if he does a lousy job, that board will fire him. But so that in the, that independent governance uh, is really important so you don't get kind of goofiness around the CEO having to do what the employee shareholders tell him or her to do. That's how we've squared that, tried to square that circle. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of intricacies of how you operationalize employee ownership. Uh, probably uh, that are extra complex in the context of having thousands of employees and billions of dollars in uh, in budget. Uh, and also, I can imagine even though there's legal complexities of in terms of the structure and, uh, uh, or are there? It's easier than you might think. Um, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not CEO anymore, so I have a little time on my hands. If any of your listeners are interested in how we did it or what some of the, the pitfalls or opportunities are, uh, tell them to call me. Seriously, I'm happy to help anybody do it. It's it's not as complicated as people make it out to be, but there are some things we've learned and I'm happy to pass those on. That is good to know. Jeff, uh, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you over the last uh, decade. Uh, I learned some new things in this conversation and I think your story of transforming Elliston from a traditional construction company that was struggling to meet payroll and only like uh, was on a week to week basis uh, to a company now that is much more diversified uh, and uh, much more profitable and much larger uh, is a, a real Canadian uh, success story that more folks um, should know about. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast uh, today. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed it a lot and I look forward to many more conversations with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right. Take care, Scott. Thanks for listening to this episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our socials and through our email list. And be sure to subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss our next episode. Have feedback on today's episode? Let us know directly in the app. Thanks again for listening and for joining the new wave of entrepreneurs. Till next time.